we're having a giveaway. I want to hear from you to find out what content you want to hear. So email me at brad at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com with a suggestion for a topic you'd like covered or a guest you'd want to hear on the show. And you'll be entered into a lottery for a PGD Yeti tumbler. I'll do the drawing in two weeks and announce the winner in our newsletter. So you have until two weeks from when you hear this, from when this airs, to enter. May the most loyal listener win. Welcome to the forefront of high-performance medical apparel, where comfort meets cutting-edge technology. Introducing Cure, spelled K-Y-U-R, where they treat medical professionals like athletes who demand the most innovative fabrics with technical styling and a performance fit from our gear. Award-winning designer Nick Sienski is leveraging his two decades of creating technically advanced apparel for Olympians, mountaineers, and astronauts to revolutionize the medical apparel market. Cure scrubs are engineered for extreme durability and ultimate comfort. Crafted with their best-in-class fabrics, they bring you the most durable scrub pants, hybrid scrub tops with certified fabric, and a thermoregulating base layer, all manufactured in the USA and using American-made textiles. Visit curemd.com, that's K-Y-U-R-M-D.com, and experience the future of medical apparel today. Save 25% when you use code PGD25 at checkout. Cure, where science meets comfort. This is part two to We Want Them Infected, how the failed quest for COVID herd immunity led doctors to embrace the anti-vaccine movement. Make sure you check out part one first. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Well, the next question was going to be, what's the allure of it? What's the allure of being the contrarian? Like, what's the benefit? But you gave it away. Like, there's money there. There's fame there. Yeah, and I think that there's sort of psychological glory of... Uh being told, oh, you are so brave and so independent and not afraid to stand up against the authority in the medical establishment. And a lot of these doctors have really surrounded themselves in an echo chamber on social media. And there's this entity that I learned about over the course of the pandemic, something called audience capture, whereby people who become public personalities, and I'm a little bit at risk for that, not a huge risk, I don't think, but begin to echo what their followers are saying. And this is what I was saying before about uh, how people have become very different over the course of the pandemic. So, you know, Dr. Prasad, for example, that I, just to repeat the example of he, he called an, an anti-flu vaccine doctor a quack. And then five or six years later, he was writing essays about the potential health benefits of contracting flu. Do we really know that, you know, we don't need to contract some respiratory viruses to prevent autoimmune disease or cancer later in life? So just in a wildly different spot. And you can kind of see how doctors who took these extreme stances and surrounded themselves in an echo chamber just were egged on by their audience. So they became really followers of their followers. You could, what their followers were saying, you know, one day they were going to be saying the next week. That sounds like Trump. Right. He was for gay marriage for, I think, most of his life or most of his political life and then became anti. And like a lot of his political stances changed. And it, that term audio, audience capture really makes sense with a lot of his and how he goes about things now. Right. I like would he, say he's a little different in that he can change his stance uh, over the course of an interview. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm not I'm not you know, I'm not. I, you know, I'm not really sure that he has principles that even last a week, I suppose. No, but you're right. But you're right. I mean, he, for example, the only time I've heard his audience boo him, sadly, is when he praised the COVID vaccine. And he is probably unlikely on the campaign trail to, to talk about that a lot. So, yeah, I mean, he's a little bit of captured to his audience as well. And you're right that he started repeating kind of QAnon memes at various points during the pandemic. And since he's left office and, and yeah, those, he obviously didn't come up with those on his own. So how do we prevent ourselves from falling into this trap of audience capture ourselves? I think you're a, a bigger personality out there than I am. You've got a, a lot more 
Twitter followers and you're, you're, you know, I'm kind of in the public eye a little bit myself. For any of the listeners, you know, you want to make sure that you're making as unbiased decisions. And by the way, we will get to your other book eventually in another interview about trying to minimize our biases in medicine. But in these other avenues, how do we make sure we're being as objective as possible and don't fall into these traps like audience capture? So I think the first thing is to recognize that you are vulnerable to it, even though you think you're not. So everyone thinks I am not vulnerable to groupthink. I am not vulnerable to audience capture, but everyone else is because it's very easy to spot someone else's heirs. And it's basically impossible to spot your own heirs or else you wouldn't believe the thing anymore. So I think that's point one is just humility to recognize vulnerability. And then number two is when someone disagrees with you in a good faith way, that's a very important caveat, be willing to listen, be willing to be open to them and recognize that you have made an heir. So I referenced before that some people had pointed out just a couple of times so far, heirs on, in my science-based medicine articles. And my first instinct was to say, no, I got it right. But then I looked into it and I had gotten it wrong. And so you just have to be open to the idea that you can, you can be corrected and that there's no shame in correcting your heir. So this is why I feel it's very important that I include my own airs in the book. I, I think I have about three or four examples of really stupid tweets that I sent that were the exact opposite of all the positions that I came to take. But just to, you know, don't let other people spot your airs if you spot them first. Publicize them, make them well known, and just recognize that that will ultimately bolster your credibility if, if you're seen as someone who can genuinely admit air. Uh, I suppose the biggest lesson, one way to summarize this is don't confuse yourself with your ideas. So don't develop an identity. Don't develop a brand. I do not try to be a hero to the COVID cautious movement. So there are some people who are, are more cautious than I am and sort of had, have dedicated their lives to not getting COVID. And I totally respect that. It's normal to want to stay healthy. It's normal not to want to get sick. But I, I don't try to be a guru in that community or a hero to them and say, you know, anyone who enters any building without a mask is the next Hitler, you know, this sort of thing. So, so try not to develop an identity in a brand. I think that's, that's important. If you find that someone disagrees with you, how do you go about disagreeing with them respectfully, right? Let's say you are approached by one of those COVID purists who, you know, want to make sure that nobody ever gets the virus again, right? They're extremely risk averse. We, of course, we all think we're being the most reasonable one in the room. How do you have an interaction with them where you disagree with their risk tolerance? We don't have to use that as an example, but do that respectfully. I mean, I think as long as people are coming from a place of good faith, and that can be a little bit hard to determine on social media because you can't determine tone of voice and, and this sort of thing. And so if someone is genuinely asking a question versus just sea lioning, for example, just asking question after question, I mean, I, I think you're probably, you know, guaranteed to have a reasonable interaction if, if that's the case. But that problem with social media is it just encourages outrage so quickly. And I'm, you know, not presenting myself as a paragon of maturity in every single one of my social media interactions. And I, I want to just go back to something you mentioned earlier about holding on too tightly to our own ideas. It's actually the IKEA effect was brought up a couple of months ago by one of my other guests, John Schneider. He's an otolaryngologist. And the IKEA effect is if you built it yourself, you give it much more value than if you didn't. And so like IKEA, right? We put together our own furniture. So it's the same with these ideas. And I think recognizing that bias exists will also go a long way towards trying to help us not fall into those traps and be flexible with our own ideas. Yeah. No, I think that that's a great point. I hadn't really thought of that, but uh, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I'm endorsing. Uh, I'll also say, uh, going back to sort of earlier conversation about one difference between skeptics and, and contrarians is I think that skeptics tend to keep a very narrow focus. So for example, what was, what was my expertise this pandemic? What could I really bring to it? 
that very few people could. I'm not the only one, but not many people could do this. And this is my odd quirk and my encyclopedic knowledge of the anti-vaccine movement. I could really see how arguments that I heard about the MMR vaccine in 2019 or the HPV vaccine Gardasil were being completely reused and repurposed with regards to the COVID vaccine. So that occupies a very large chunk of my book. In contrast, the doctors who I write about were experts in every, every, or thought they were, every aspect of the pandemic, from lockdowns, from school closures, from masks, from testing, to ventilations, to vaccines, to Paxlovid, to remdesivir, to, you know, they, they knew it all with complete certainty and little doubt. And I think that's, it's very important to recognize that people who are trustworthy say a lot about a little. And there's massive aspects of the pandemic. I've never commented on its origins, for example, than what the next viral mutation means, because I don't know. And there's a million people who are going to know this stuff better than me. Or the, you know, you asked me about the effects of lockdowns. And I kind of avoided that question because that's <laughs> not that I think about it, just because really, I don't know. I mean, that's more of a sort of sociological, you know, I could give you my answer, but it wouldn't be that much better than the average guy on the street. So there we go. That's why I didn't answer your question, because I didn't really know. <laughs> So while we're on the topic of those vaccine arguments, and I think it goes a long way towards helping those who are skeptics about the vaccines to illustrating that these are arguments that have been used about other vaccines, that these are not new arguments, because it really undermines the argument if they're just using it, the same argument over and over for different vaccines. So what are those some of those arguments that you saw play out again and again? Yeah, so... A lot of the chapters in in the book are organized uh, essentially this way. I will lay out an argument that anti-vaxxers used against the measles vaccine in 2018. And then I will show how that exact language is repurposed for the COVID vaccines. And this was anti-vaxxers have two goals. Number one is to minimize the harms of the virus. So you would read things, you know, measles only killed 500 children per year before the vaccine. That was 10 times fewer than died in car crashes and cancer, you know, this sort of stuff. And then you would read an article by Vinay Prasad, and he would use that exact same language about COVID. More children died in car crashes and drownings than COVID, as if that's an acceptable reason to let some children die of COVID. And then the second part is that vaccines are ineffective or vaccines are dangerous. So anti-vaxxers would treat reactions to the measles vaccine or real or imagined as a fate worse than death. They would treat uh, autism. Of course, the MMR does not cause autism, but they would treat that as, 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 as a fate worse than death from measles. And that's what happened a lot during the pandemic is the vaccine was found to cause myocarditis, heart inflammation. That is not an imagined link, unlike the link between uh, MMR and autism anyways. And you don't want to minimize this, but nearly every study on the subject says that the vast majority of children do well. They have a mild, benign course. And you can argue, as I have, that it's never mild or benign when a child goes to the hospital. But most children stay one day and they go home and they seem to be fine, thankfully. However you want to talk about that, it's not as bad as death from the virus. But a lot of the doctors who I discussed treated that side effect and other vaccine side effects literally as a fate worse than death. They would say anyone who worried about children dying of COVID was being breathless and hysterical and fear mongering. Uh, But when talking about vaccine side effects, again, not as bad as death, they would say this is catastrophic and devastating. They would speak that way. And I think it's important to recognize that a lot of these doctors were against the, the COVID vaccine, especially for children, even before there was a vaccine. So the vaccine for adolescents was first authorized in May 2021, uh, but several months before that, and and the data from that trial was first released a month before that via a Pfizer press release in April 2021. So before that, there was no data about the pediatric COVID vaccine, which in the randomized controlled trial was found to be 100% effective. But Vinay Prasad in January and February 2021 was arguing against vaccinating children uh, before there was any data about it. And some of his arguments at the time were that children were less likely to get COVID, that COVID was going away, and so they didn't need to be vaccinated. The next year, 2022, he was still against vaccinating children, although instead of saying children were less likely to get COVID and COVID was going away, 
He said they don't need the vaccine because they've all had COVID already, that you know, 90% of children have antibodies to it. So why are you going to vaccinate them? So when cases were going down, in 2021, he was against vaccinating children. When cases were going up in 2022, he was against vaccinating children. So that children should not be vaccinated was the core belief of many of these doctors. And the facts on the ground were used to support that no matter what they were. And it also seems a contradiction that they are calling for more randomized controlled trials, and yet they're using observational studies to make their arguments, right? Like you can't have it both ways. You can't use an observational study to support, to push against the vaccines, and yet say that you can't use observational data for an argument for the vaccines, right? Yeah, it seems a, a contradiction. Yeah. So first of all, when it comes to the pediatric COVID vaccine, it was studied in three randomized or six. There were six randomized controlled trials for Pfizer and Moderna. They each did three of three separate age groups, adolescents, elementary school children, and then babies and toddlers. And there were just shy of 25,000 children enrolled in these RCTs. So that's not a small amount of children. However, doctors can always call for one more RCT, one bigger RCT. And this is a very old fashioned anti-vaccine technique. There's a formal term for it called methodolatry, the, ri- the, the worship of randomized controlled trials. So before the pandemic, for example, anti-vaxxers would often complain that there's never been an RCT of the entire vaccine schedule. So sure, you can show me one of one of the polio vaccine. You can show me one of the MR, MMR vaccine, but you can't show me a randomized control trial of the MMR, HPV, you know, all the 20 vaccines that children receive. It seems like you can move that goalpost indefinitely. Of course you can. And such a trial would be impossible for a thousand reasons. Parents wouldn't enroll their children in it. <laughs> no ethical doctor would perform it. And would would it have to last the entire human lifespan to make sure, you you know, so there's a bazillion reasons this trial never could or would be done. But that's the point, right? That that their point isn't because they want a randomized control trial to be done. Their point is to sow doubt and fear and mistrust. And that technique was repurposed during the pandemic. They would say that the pediatric COVID vaccine trials were too small because you could never really, you could show that it stopped COVID, but you couldn't show that it stopped severe COVID because those outcomes are, are, are fortunately very rare in children. And they were saying they were too small to detect side effects. So some doctors called for RCTs of hundreds of thousands of children, and they didn't encourage parents to enroll their children in COVID vaccine trials. They never promoted the COVID RCTs. It was just another way of of creating doubt and anger and mistrust. And their real goal was to communicate to parents, this vaccine hasn't really been tested. We really don't know if it works or if it's safe. Now, once the vaccine had been licensed or, or approved, there have been now close to 25 studies from around the world, all showing the same thing, that the COVID vaccine is not perfect. Uh, for children. It's not a panacea. Vaccinated children have gotten sick and vaccinated children have died, but it reduces the risk of rare but grave outcomes uh, substantially. And a lot of children have been spared a lot of suffering due to the vaccine. If we had not vaccinated children, a lot more children would have died. And all of the things that they said about COVID was less dangerous for children than drowning wouldn't have been true. The fact that we have did a decent job of protecting some children and vaccinated millions of them is the sole reason they can say more children died of drowning than COVID. So they're kind of victims of their own success. I don't know if that's the right expression, but there you go. I think so. I think so. I think so. So what has been their reaction to the book? You call out quite a few people. You name names. You've got receipts. It's all in the book. Yeah, so that's how far, they reacted to it, other than being blocked on Twitter. Yeah, so thus far, I think five doctors have responded in one way or another. Dr. J. Bhattacharya responded with straw man arguments, meaning he put words in my mouth to argue against words I never said. For example, saying I wanted people locked down forever. I didn't want children to ever go back to school, you know, these sorts of things. And I never took a stance on any of those policies because who the hell was listening to me anyway? 
So he argued against words that I never said. I think the reaction of a few other doctors has been to just call me names. One doctor called me a schmuck. One doctor called me vile, unhinged, deeply dishonest. Another doctor posed with a book. I think he may be the only one who bought it. I don't think he actually read it with a <laughs> thumbs down sign. And he unleashed this long sort of tirade on Twitter about my book sales, for example, which are doing okay, by the way. And other, one other doctor essentially called it a grift and used the fact that I wrote a book, that its mere existence was evidence that it wasn't true. Oh, he's just trying to sell his book as if every single author, every, I mean, that would disqualify every book that's ever written, I suppose. Unless it was being given away, you know, like, you know, people give away re religious literature in the subway, I suppose. But no, none of them have attempted to seriously engage with any of the ideas, any of the science, any of the data. And really all that would require them to do is stand up for their own words, because as large chunks of the book are just their quotes saying two and a half years ago, you know, we're herd immunity has arrived. We're going to have herd immunity. Don't worry about the variants. So if any of these doctors want to argue with me, all they really have to do is stand up for their own words, argue that they were right, that COVID was going to kill 40,000 Americans, that variants were nothing to worry about, that, that we reached herd immunity in May 2021. And it's like we should continue to let children suffer and die of COVID in, per in perpetuity. All of these people are still on TV. They've all got big followings. The fact that they've been so wrong about it seems to be without consequence. And in fact, their followings have increased because they are echoing what people want to hear, right? All of this misinformation, it's frightening because misinformation may be the, the thing that ends humanity, right? Like climate change is only getting worse. People aren't motivated to do anything about it because of perceived lack of consequences or lack of ability to do anything. You know, it's all from misinformation. Climate change comes with more zoonotic diseases. So this is not going to be the last pandemic that's in, in our lifetime. This is all very discouraging and depressing, right? So what, let's end it on a brighter note. What gives you hope? So what gives me hope is I think that First of all, we have to recognize that these are still a small number of doctors, that they happen to be vocal, but it's a little bit the squeaky wheel who gets the grease. I mean, I think most doctors recognize that uh, COVID was a horrible, devastating virus that if it had been uh, allowed to run roughshod throughout the country would have resulted in mass deaths. Uh, most doctors are, 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 are pro-vaccine for, for themselves and, and, and for children. So it's a, it's a small number uh, of people. I also think that there is a growing recognition of the dangers of medical misinformation. So before the pandemic, uh, people who were debunking it, and I was a little bit kind of on the down low, but uh, my predecessors at, at science-based medicine or the founders of it, they're still there, you know, Steve Novella and David Gorski. I mean, they were kind of seen, they never got a lot of professional recognition for this, at least from their universities. I think a lot of other doctors looked up to them, but it was kind of seen as a, as a hobby, for example. Um, and they, they got a, a, a attacked quite a bit. And I think there's a growing recognition that the work that they did is actually very important. I do end the book with sort of suggestions about what can we do about this. And I don't really know, to be honest with you, I don't come down in favor of any laws censoring physicians simply because I worry that one day someone like Ron DeSantis might become president. Fortunately, he's flaming out now big time, but you know, and he might appoint, he said that he would consider appointing RFK Jr. as CDC director. So I don't want him making any sort of rules about what I can and can't say. So what I really come down on in the book is that doctors should speak out. We should not be afraid to police misinformation. I think one lesson of the book is that certain medical students have shown more courage than leaders of American medicine who have been silent as members of their profession and members of their department spread rank misinformation. They are so terrified of being called nasty things on social media. They are so terrified of being called a censor that they censor themselves. And I think what gives me hope is that, you know, more doctors are recognizing 
no, we don't have to fight every fight. And, you know, you know, we don't have to, we got to be careful not to amplify misinformation that might otherwise go unseen, but that we shouldn't look it over either. We shouldn't just call it, when someone spreads completely fake numbers, we shouldn't just say they're thinking differently. Well, I'm glad that we were able to end that on a high note and hopefully a little bit of a motivating note for the listeners to get out there and do what they can to spread as much real information to combat the misinformation because it is it does become a volume game of what is out there. So Dr. Jonathan Howard, we want them infected. You don't want them infected, but please go out and get the book and read it. It it is really engaging and interesting and and thank you again for writing it and for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me back. I look forward to episode number 4, 5 and 6. A final word from our sponsor. Remember when you choose Cure, you're not just picking the most advanced medical apparel but you're also contributing to social responsibility. Their profits help empower communities through Mission 14. Go to curemd.com to learn more and make a difference today. Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review, something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. Even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you, this is not a doctor-patient relationship and this is not medical advice or financial advice or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to The Physician's Guide to Doctoring.